There is a great honor among thieves, and a great many talents shared by those who make thievery their business. To wander aimlessly across society's dark underbelly is to be condemned as someone else's meal. To walk with purpose is to survive, and perhaps even to thrive. To do well in the shadows, one must possess talent and wit, discernment and enthusiasm. They must maintain strength against temptation, patience against adversity, and they must always move quickly to pass through the mists that surround them from all sides. In Russian, there is a word that means thief, vor. To be a vor in Russia is a dangerous business, and if one wishes to be a successful vor, one is unlikely to achieve that goal while traveling alone. To be a vor is a dangerous business. But to be within the Vorovsky Mir, inside the world of thieves, is to find safety and brotherhood. It's that brotherhood that we'll be taking a closer look at today, the Bratva, otherwise known as the Russian Mafia. Conceived under the SARS of the 18th and 19th centuries, enduring under decade after decade of Soviet rule, and persevering within a new Russian state where the line between Vor and oligarch is often blurred, the Bratva and the underground network they've created rivals the best and most dangerous criminal enterprises in the world. From the time of the Tsars to the Soviets to Yeltsin and Putin, Russia's government hasn't ever really not been authoritarian. The question instead has been how authoritarian and in what way is it authoritarian? Permeating that authoritarian structure at just about every level has been theft as an instrument to gain wealth at somebody else's expense. Nobles or aristocrats take from the villages. Party bosses oversee a one-way flow of resources within the party. Every modern business has its oligarchy. Every judge and every policeman has a price. In this sort of world, a thief who decides not to hide behind a veil of legitimacy isn't abnormal because they are a person who steals. They are abnormal because they are a person that will admit they steal. The origins of the Bratva are of the same time as folk heroes like Van Kain, brought up in the hard years of the 18th and 19th centuries. At the time, policing in Russia was almost non-existent. For a population of about 120 million people, Russia only employed about 48,000 police nationwide, a ratio of one officer to about 2,500 people. Most of those police were concentrated in major cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, while in the countryside there were about 90 million Russian peasants doing their best to scrape out a living, with only some 8,000 or so law enforcement authorities scattered across the landscape. In an absence of official avenues to settle legal issues, Russian villagers employed a sort of frontier justice that was as brutal and inventive as it was effective. In isolated communities with very few enforceable rules, an act like murder or arson or even petty theft would be treated under the moral codes of a lynch mob, often with the manner and violence of punishment meant equal parts for the perpetrator and for anyone else who might get the same idea in the future. These rules and their enforcement structures were often completely separate from the will of aristocrats and landlords who would be quick to prosecute, say, a peasant stealing firewood from their estate, but who wouldn't really be bothered if one peasant killed another in a drunken argument. As a Russian peasant proverb goes, God punishes sins, the state punishes guilt. But this all assumes that Russian life broke down into two groups, the peasantry and the aristocracy. In truth, there was a third unit to consider, Russia's bandit class, which had already organized into small bands with more than enough muscle to harass peasants in the wilderness or take over villages on occasion. The worst of these were the horse thieves, who would take some of the rural peasants' most valuable property and catch the worst punishment if they were ever caught. Over the span of decades, or even centuries, the war between peasant and bandit spun upward, with peasants learning to organize and resist, and bandits learning how to form strong and coordinated gangs that could do more than just conduct small raids. Eventually, the gangs began to set up production rackets, pay us money, and we won't steal your horses. Those evolved into a criminal architecture with its own hierarchies, gang territories, informant networks, and links to corrupt police and horse dealers. But these horse thieves didn't evolve into the modern Bradford. The demand for horses during World War I and the societal restructuring that came after the rise of the Bolsheviks caused these groups to waste away. Instead, the Bradford's roots came from peasants that had long watched the gangs operate in the countryside before leaving home and attempting to find their way in the big city. 
Despite their best efforts, the majority of these peasants would eventually end up in city slums, where the so-called Vorovsky Mir, the thieves' world, first germinated. Set adrift in stinking poor and often violent parts of these cities, the more cunning members of the disenfranchised peasant class quickly came to understand that they could turn to the same sort of violence as the bandits in the countryside. Here, there was no community to defend. Instead, they found a vast zero-sum game in which they were essentially invisible and in which someone else would often have to go hungry if they themselves wanted to eat. These communities were chronically neglected by the Tsars and typically avoided by the police who knew better than to enter the slums in ones and twos or even small squads. As such, the Vorovsky Mir essentially ran unchecked and specialized gangs began to pop up, specializing in pickpocketing, burglary, kidnapping, intimidation, or even worse. Gangster bosses often became local legends, and many among their number began to infiltrate Russian civil society. Many figures who would become important in the following decades would cut their teeth in this environment, not least among them were Joseph Stalin, who would run an armed robbery and protection racket before the October Revolution. All right, so let's talk for a moment about the October Revolution. By the time of the revolution, the Vorovsky Mir had its hooks not just in the Tsarist aristocracy that had collapsed, but among the ranks of the Bolsheviks as well. Stalin himself was just one example. Many revolutionaries were also Vor and vice versa, while still others owed their success or even their safety to the conditional benevolence of the underworld. The three successive blows to Russia in the late 1910s and early 1920s, first the Great War, then the October Revolution, then the Russian Civil War, took the lives of countless individual for, but the cynical and often savage structures of the slums were far better equipped for overall survival than high-minded groups of Bolsheviks could ever hope to be. The result was a process in two directions. Many thugs and career criminals joined the Bolsheviks in order to get in on the winning side, thus greatly enhancing their standing for the simple price of endorsing Marxist ideals, while many Bolsheviks were forced to ingratiate themselves with the Vorovsky Mir in order to achieve victory. The balance this achieved would overwhelmingly favor the Vorovsky Mir. Very rare was a Russian gangster that had even a fleeting interest in leaving the prosperity of criminal enterprise behind. But very common was a revolutionary who could learn to rationalize the importance of working with Russia's more unsavory characters. Russia's early systems of organized crime were strengthened during the rise of the Bolsheviks, but it was during the reign of one of their own, the aforementioned Joseph Stalin, that the Vorovsky Mir would need to adapt. Stalin's gulag system of labor camps redefined Soviet society in a way that the October Revolution never could, and the consequences were devastating for anyone who got swept up, including many of the Vor. These camps had a wide range of effects on the Vorovsky Mir. In fact, in part, they were a business opportunity, a way to extend the black market within the camps and recruit from the inside. But more importantly, they were a cultural melting pot for criminals from all across Russia. In the gulags, gangsters engaged in a unique sort of cultural cross-pollination, exchanging their values and ideas while also sharing their tips and tricks for running the Soviet underbelly. A prison newspaper at the Vyatlag camp described the camp as a real school offering courses of the second stage training for future skilled, stylish criminals. Elements of criminal morality were encouraged through the camps, a worldview of what was right or wrong as a vor, and professional skills of thievery, fraud, forgery, and much more was taught and practiced so that when a vor eventually left their gulag, they were able to bring those skills back to whichever city they ended up in. The gulags also gave rise to another specific element in Bradford culture, the vor ver zakon, the thief within the code. The term described a specific kind of authority figure within the Russian Mafia, similar to what we might imagine as a godfather in the Italian Mafia, although those terms were not exactly directly transferable. A Vor Vezacone could be a gang leader or a particularly menacing criminal, but they didn't have to be. Instead, they were highly respected, almost intellectual figures who could teach their underlings, play a role of judge or mediator among their peers, and be both an uh, example and an enforcer of the Code of Thebes. That code eventually grew into a precise, rigid set of expectations, both reinforcing the hierarchy of the Vorovsky Mir and reinforcing the principle that honest thieves watched out for honest thieves. 
Avor was free to say, shoot a party official in the head, but not to neglect payments on a lost bet made with another Vor. Punishments were often corporal and brutal. For example, a Vor who committed the offense of getting a gang tattoo he hadn't earned would be lucky if his only punishment was to have the tattooed skin cut from his body. More severe infractions, for example, selling out fellow criminals to the police would almost certainly be punished by death, with the victim considered lucky if he got to decide whether he was thrown off a cliff or have his throat cut. While in the gulags, the Vor also got to impose their will on the camp's other inhabitants, the petty crooks and political dissidents who hadn't been a part of the Soviet criminal underworld in any meaningful way prior to their arrival. These prisoners suffered brutally under the Vor, who typically forced them to meet the Vor's labor quotas. After all, one central part of the code of the Vorovsky Mir was that one did not waste their work in order to contribute to the state under any circumstance. These prisoners would suffer many forms of abuse rape, theft, beatings, and exile to the coldest bunks or corners of their labor camps. Their reality was, as many Vor would tell them, you die today, and I'll die tomorrow. While World War II posed a great hardship for Vor and non-Vor alike, and sent many to the front lines where they would ultimately be killed, the war didn't fundamentally disrupt the power structure within the camps. What posed a bigger problem was the efforts of the state to maintain totalitarian control after the war claimed the lives of tens of millions of Soviets, including many of those who had been most loyal to the state structure. In the camps, that meant the line between guard and prisoner would have to blur in order to keep control with limited numbers. Many of the Vor thus joined forces with the camp guards in exchange for even more preferential treatments, often including explicit perks and benefits. Some would become guards or administrators or even command their gulag while a remaining a prisoner, and they could also access the outside world, bringing their camp into the Mafia's broader criminal enterprise. But to do so, they would inherently have to break the thieves' code by entering into an alliance with the state. The ones who chose to collaborate were labeled suki, bitches by the traditionalists and made their own lives forfeit in the process. But as the ranks of the Suka continued to swell, they gained their own protection from each other and the state. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, the gulags would be divided in the Suka Voina, Bitches War, between the traditionalists and the collaborationists of the gulags criminal class. The Soviet state most likely played some role in the violence, but regardless, the camps were at war with themselves several years, and by and large, the so-called bitches won. When Stalin died in 1953, the gulag system was downsized in a major way. About a million former prisoners were released and scattered to the wind, many of them are returning to the brat for organizations in their respective home cities, or whichever ones happened to be closest. In the following seven years, the gulag population would shrink by about four-fifths, and as such, they went from being the incubator of the Vorovsky Mir to being only a minimally important location on its periphery. Having got the better of the bitches' war, the camp state collaborators would disperse throughout the Soviet Union, spreading a massive cultural change through the Bratva. Now it was no longer necessary to operate completely independently from the state. If corrupt members of the party or local leaders felt like contributing to the Vorovsky Mir, well, that was just good business. In many ways, the 1960s and 1970s were a dark age for the Bratva. After all, any mafia who attempted to operate within the Soviet Union would have to compete with the super-mafia that was the Communist Party, and in that regard, they were hopelessly outmatched. Not only that, but the Suka had been able to leverage their connections with the party in order to carve out a place for small-scale organizations in exchange for their compliance and making sure that nothing major took place outside of the state's control. This change had an unexpected side effect for the Soviet state. The new generation of Russian thugs, uh, which might otherwise have become part of the Bratva and been subject to its discipline, instead organized into unruly street gangs that used massive neighborhood brawls to settle their differences. Sometimes the more successful among the street gangs might get involved in protection or burglary themselves, but with none of the operational sophistication or survivability of their forefathers. During these years, the remnants of the Vorovsky Mir had been slowly extending their influence upwards in Russian society, tying the black market in more closely with the Soviet state as it began to decay. Organized crime became the middleman between the state, the black markets, and the rest of the population as Soviet Russia began to depend fully on corruption as a means of survival. By becoming indispensable to civil society, the Vor began to gain back some of the leverage that they'd lost in the post-Stalin years. This influence was parlayed into tribute payments in exchange for overseeing the transfer of goods 
into the hands of people who wanted them. The gangs began to find more of an overarching sense of unity again, with many of their appointed leaders meeting in so-called congresses to debate large-scale business moves like whether or not to sell drugs or how to react to changes in police organization. So. When one Mikhail Gorbachev came calling in the mid-1980s, attempting to usher in a period of large-scale change within the Soviet Union, the Vorovsky Mir was well-placed to take advantage of the chaos that he would unintentionally cause. It's honestly quite impressive just how frequently Gorbachev implemented policies that helped the Vor. He would campaign against alcohol, thus creating more black market demand. He would encourage semi-private business, giving the Vor a mechanism to launder money. And in an especially helpful act, he collapsed the Soviet Union at the exact moment when the Vorovsky Mir was becoming richer than ever before and enlisting those pesky street gangs we discussed earlier as a form of muscle. When the party collapsed, the Vor had already significantly diversified their operations, and their ranks were swelled not just with street thugs, but with unemployed but gifted athletes and disenfranchised combat veterans who had served in the Soviet war in Afghanistan. They were ready for a collapse that, by now, everyone saw coming. By the time the final nails had been placed into the Soviet coffin, the Vorovsky Mir had already made its plans to divide up power and territory among the many Russian republics. It also made preparations to take over industry, civil society, and any portion of illegitimate enterprise that had yet been untouched. And the man who was taking over, Boris Yeltsin, made clear through his actions that he wasn't particularly interested in standing in the way of the Bradford. In many ways, the post-Soviet world was a perfect environment for organized crime. Wealth inequality among Russian citizens had spiraled fully out of control, with massive portions of society desperate to make ends meet however they could. Police had very little in the way of manpower, and even less in resources, and much like their ancestors in the days of the Tsars, they knew better than to attempt to throw their pitiful weight around in mob-controlled areas. With limited and ineffective economic protections to stop them, many of the Vor transitioned their illegal enterprises into legal or semi-legal ones, and others treated the time for what it was, pure economic anarchy. With so much to gain and so little to lose, except for lives that the Vor had valued only minimally in the best of times, individual gangs went to war in the name of greater territorial control and profit margins. These gang wars often became incredibly violent, with the winners and losers often determined not just by who could accumulate the most firepower, but who could keep their own gangs from turning inward on themselves in yet more violence. The winners established dominion over their territory, where they basically lived unquestioned. But to collect the highest possible share of that territory's revenues, they would have to prove their ability to provide dependable protection and fair regulation while maintaining a firm and a cunning grip on their customers. As such, many of the principles of the old war became important again. One's status as an honest thief, one's ability to demonstrate their own strength and influence through limited violence rather than war, and the ability to treat crime as business. But this also came with crucial changes. Now, one's word to clients and partners outside the world of the war would have to carry just as much weight as a promise to another mobster and in a world shared by lesser criminals, a serious mob authority would often have to conduct shows of force in order to prove legitimacy, even while trying to avoid large-scale violence. As mobsters got better and better at playing this game, the violence subsided and gave way to almost entirely proper business. The unrestrained corruption and mob rule of the 1990s gave way somewhat in the 2000s, when one Vladimir Putin rose to power, thus jeopardizing the thieves' a world of Vorovsky Mir. Worried about a larger crackdown, many gangsters brought some assets out of Russia and made other preparations. But for the most part, their fears were all misplaced. Putin, after all, had his own connections with the underworld, and without explicitly saying so, he crafted an official state policy in which mobsters that were willing to operate discreetly and grease the palms of their corresponding officials were mostly unbothered. Much like he did with Russia's oligarch class, Putin ensured that his government could work smoothly with people who really held power and influence in his country. In this new world, 
life changed for the Bratva. No longer uh, were their insular rituals or traditions necessary or even appropriate. Their tattoos, especially the highly visible ones, were equally antiquated, and so were the old gang songs and slang that had come out of the gulags. Someone who had done five or ten sentences in prison was no longer a hardened leader, but a liability in negotiations with legitimate business owners. The spiritual leaders of yesteryear, the Vori of Zaccone, have largely had their titles reappropriated as a show of vanity for particularly influential gangsters, even when those gangsters have done nothing to actually earn their titles. The few traditionalists left resented the change, but even they were forced to face the facts. The Brava was no longer a brotherhood among the cast-offs and the wretched, but instead an immensely valuable enterprise that must be treated as such. In today's world, the Bradfa run parallel to so many other global underground networks. The Italian Mafia, the Japanese Yakuza, the Chinese Triads. And do let us know, by the way, if you'd like to see videos about any of those groups. But in many ways, the Bradfa are very much their own thing. They may have a fairly similar overall structure. The inner circle, the associates, the outside contractors, and the wannabe members. But the Bradfa inhabit a generally non-hierarchical world spread across individual territories with little overall coordination. And rather than specializing strictly in certain sorts of criminal enterprise, a local Bradford will typically have its influence working across most sectors, building a network in which individual gangsters can move laterally between industries or vertically within structures of control and influence with freedom to trust the people that they're working with. As for how a gangster learns who to trust, a lot of these initiation rituals are either murky or specific to individual groups. But in a general sense, thieves' honor is just as important today as ever. Mutual profitability, even between gangs that share the same region or major city, is far more important than risking the scrutiny that car bombs or snipers would bring. Individual Bradfa have a fairly outsized impact in Russia. For example, the Chechen Mafia, fiercely loyal to their own ranks and very skillful at exacting violence onto their enemies. The Chechen Mafia in particular has long been inextricably linked with the Chechen authorities, including its first president, who oversaw a particularly corrupt few years of Chechen history. But even outside of their region, the Chechen brand of mafia control has been almost a franchise within the Bradford, a reputation for honesty, loyalty, and unbelievable levels of violence towards their own or their clients' enemies. Many Russian gangs pay a cut of their proceeds to the nearest Chechen gangster in order to share that reputation. And so too is often the case with others among Russia's ruling class. Currently made up of a small and tremendously influential group of oligarchs, Russia's elite are known for a long, long list of shady business dealings and mob connections. In 2022, the United States-based think tank, the Atlantic Council, estimated that Russia's oligarchs controlled about $250 billion in what's referred to as dark money, made from a mix of theft from Russia's state budget, extortion of private businesses, and seizures of profitable enterprises. In all these ventures, the hand of the Bratva cannot be mistaken. And what the oligarchs end up with as the Bratva's modern sponsors is likely only a portion of the overall revenues that the mobsters are able to collect. As the presence of those oligarchs would suggest, the Bradfer has also gone global, extending its influence in a long list of nations. In some cases, the group is a dominant force in that country's criminal underworld. Elsewhere, they're facilitators, lending their expertise and input on a wide range of enterprises. Internationally, as in Russian society, the Bradford keep a wide portfolio, and they diversify not only within criminal enterprises, but across legitimate and semi-legitimate ones as well. And they've been more than happy to feed off of Russia's annexation of Crimea and low-grade war in the Donbass region of Ukraine, expanding their influence while building a thriving black market there. In the future, it's difficult to say what precisely will happen to and within the Bradfa. Certainly their control within Russian society means that they're unlikely to give up control anytime soon, and with Russia quickly becoming a pariah state over the course of its invasion of Ukraine, it's likely that the black market might be rushing towards a golden age, which will put the 90s to shame. In perhaps more immediate terms, the war is also prompting concerns about a reshuffle at the top level within Russia's underworld. The Bradford boss, Grisha Moskovsky, warned in late 2022 that Chechen dictator Ramzan Kadyrov and Evgeny Prigozhin, leader of the paramilitary Wagner group, may be positioning for conflict either with Vladimir Putin with each other 
or both in a battle that would certainly have ramifications for the rest of the Russian criminal sphere. These days, when looking at Russia, it's hard to tell uh, quite where the state ends and where the Bratva begins, but in reality, we'd contend that that's probably the wrong way of looking at it. After so many years of adaptation and so many years of progressively deepening ties between uh, Russia's government and its criminal sector, it makes more sense to think of Russian society as on a continuum. Very rarely is an enterprise 100% legitimate, and very rarely will a person have absolutely no connections or even second or third degree links to organized crime. And very rarely does a criminal enterprise truly exist on its own, completely untethered from the Russian state. As is so often the case, the reality lies somewhere in the middle. In this case, it's built on the backs of honest thieves who today cultivate a Russia that is very much their own.